Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Office of Interprofessional Global Health, Global Health Grand Rounds, featuring Dr. Kwan Q. Lai, um, who will deliver her presentation, Global Health and Medical Volunteering to us this afternoon. I will note that this, is, this event is CME credit eligible, and the planner and speaker have nothing to disclose. Those that have um, any questions regarding CME credits may contact Courtney Muir directly at Courtney.Muir at rosinfranklin.edu. Originally from Penang, Malaysia, Dr. Lai came to the United States on a full scholarship to attend Wellesley College. She would go on to become a Harvard Medical Faculty Physician with a specialty in infectious disease. In 2006, she left her position as a full-time professor of medicine, dedicating part of her time to humanitarian work. Dr. Lai devo devoted her ex expertise to address the global HIV AIDS pandemic and make major contributions in emergency and disaster relief in various parts of the world, including the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the Syrian war, the refugee crises, the war in Yemen, and the coronavirus pandemic in New York. She is a three-time recipient of the U.S. Presidential Volunteer Service Award and the lead author of many professional publications and presentations, as well as a contributor to the Infectious Disease Society Science Speaks blog post. Her book debut, Lest We Forget, A Doctor's Experience with Life and Death During the Ebola Outbreak, was published in 2018 um, I am reading the book. Uh, I don't know if you're able to, to see it right here. Um, and I, I can say it is uh, quite riveting and it is an outstanding and an insightful read. Her second book, um, Into Africa, Out of Academia, a doctor's memoir, was just published in October of this year. And I, along with many others, eagerly anticipate reading it. Dr. Lai's background is incredibly impressive to be certain. I wanted to save one of her more impressive accomplishments for the last. She is a proud graduate of the Chicago Medical School. Everyone, please feel free to use your celebratory emojis. <laughs> and we are certainly proud to have you, Dr. Lai, amongst our distinguished alumni. Dr. Lai, although this is done virtually, I welcome you back to CMS, and we are happy to have you speak to us today. Thank you, Dr. Lawson, for that kind introduction. I want to thank you of the Inter Interprofessional Global Health Office of Chicago Medical School for inviting, inviting me to this Grand Rounds. And I also want to thank you all for taking the time to attend. As, uh, as Dr. Lawson said, my title of the uh, talk will be Global Health and Medical Volunteering. And I would like to, uh, to say a few words about my background so you could understand why I went on to go to volunteer. And then during the Grand Rounds, I would also go over se several of my volunteering experiences. And at the end, talk about the world we live in and leaving maybe a little bit of time for questions and answers. I was born in a little island called Penang, uh, on the west coast of the Malayan Peninsula in Southeast Asia. Sometime in the 1950s, uh, when we were still a British colony, uh, United States of America came to this island and set up a United States Information Service, or USIS, in this building. My secondary school teacher brought us one afternoon after class on a field trip. And he told us that in there, there was a free library where we could all borrow books. Unbeknownst to him, that free library opened up my world. Perhaps a cynic might say that the United States of America had an agenda, but to my innocent mind, I only saw the kindness and the goodness of others. In this library, I began to borrow quite a number of books and began to read avidly, and I learned about Dr. Tom Dooley. He went to Cambodia and Vietnam and set up several hospitals to care for the poor. 
And around the same time, a friend of mine told me about Dr. Albert Schweitzer. He too went to Africa and he set up hospital for the poor as well. These two men touch and inspire me deeply when I was young and I thought at some point in my life, I need to spend part of it caring for the people who need care the most. I came from a very poor family and the end of my secondary school spelled the end of my education. I learned from a rich friend of my sister who returned for summer vacation from a university in America that some colleges and universities awarded scholarships for needy and meritorious students. The spark of hope brought me to the same library where I researched for United States colleges to apply to. After a long search and some applications afterwards, I was accepted by Wellesley College and received a full scholarship with room and board. Now my alma mater's motto, non ministrari sat ministrari, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Because of Wellesley's generosity and his faith in a young lady halfway across the world, it also inspires me to pay it forward. I also like to put a word uh, for Chicago Medical School. I started my healthcare career at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Upon the advice of my college foreign student advisor, she noted that even very qualified foreign students from years past were unable to get into medical school. That I should consider other healthcare professions. So I was accepted by the dental school right after my junior college, uh, junior school, um, junior year in college. And the first two years of my dental school, we spent it on at the Harvard Medical School. Late into the fourth year of my dental school, I decided that dentistry was not for me. My first love was still medicine. So I applied to medical school late in my fourth year. Some schools argued with me that I already had a professional degree, that I would be wasting the resources already spent on me. But by then I was very desperate not to spend the rest of my life doing something that I wasn't passionate about. Thankfully, Chicago Medical School accepted me and I was grateful to be given the chance to do something that I love. When I arrived in 1977 at Chicago Medical School, a young woman working at the financial aid office took me aside and we discussed how I was going to finance my two years of medical school. Because of her knowledge and advice, I was able to apply and receive the scholarship from the American Association of University Women towards the tuition cost of my last year of medical school. The Asian tsunami of 2005 devastated parts of Southeast Asia. The picture, pictures on the television moved me to go there and help. That was my first medical volunteering experience, and I truly enjoy it. My colleagues asked me why I even care about a tsunami occurring halfway around the world. They didn't know that I was from the neck of the wood. I spent three weeks in a little village in South India, providing medical care. When I returned, I decided it was time for me to leave academia and change the focus of my life to medical volunteering. I had always wanted to go to Africa, but the first volunteering opportunity I found was with International Center for Equal Healthcare Access, and they sent me to Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon in Vietnam where I mentored the local healthcare people in the care of HIV AIDS. 2007, I volunteered with the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS Initiatives, or CHI, and they started several HIV programs in Dar es Salaam, which is the capital of Tanzania, in Zanzibar, as well as in Mutuara. Mutuara was a rural village that I ended up in the southeastern corner of Tanzania. 
And looking at the map of Tanzania, I realized that Mount Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania. At the time, I said to myself, I have to go and climb it, even, never mind if I had not climbed a high mountain before. So the first thing I did when I went to Africa was to climb up to its highest point. And this is the glacier very close to the peak of Kilimanjaro. And here we are. I am with, at the peak with my guide, Moses and Peter. At the end of the, my hike, I rewarded myself to a, a safari in the Serengeti Plain, and we got to see lots of wildlife, including wildebeest, lions. Eventually, I slowly made my way to uh, Dar es Salaam and flew to uh, Mutwara. And here is a hospital called Ligula Hospital. Ligula Hospital was opened in 1964, and it was the first hospital that I saw in Africa. There was no running water, and rarely one could access any hand-washing facility. When the beds were full, patients often share a bed and provided their own sheets, and the relatives care and cook for them. A nurse was usually assigned to a ward of close to 20 patients, virtually impossible for her to care for all the patients. Patients have to buy their own medicine in a pharmacy before they could be dispensed in the ward. In other words, if they were unable to afford it, they would not be treated. There were also two different cost schedules. If a patient was cared for by a doctor, as opposed to a house officer, the cost of the medicine will be twice as much. As you can see, aspirin is 200, 200 shillings as opposed to 400 shillings uh, prescribed by a doctor. My role in Mutwara was mainly being a mentor in the HIV AIDS program. At the end of my volunteering, I decided to explore the western part of uh, Tanzania by Lake Tanganyika and travel to Gombe Stream National Park, where Jane Goodall Jane did her Goodall. research for uh, the chimpanzee. I also went to the site where Henry Morton Stanley found Dr. Livingston after two to three years' search in the African continent. After I returned from Africa, and so in that same year, I just wanted more of it. And I applied, and I was accepted by the Infectious Disease Society of America to teach at the Infectious Disease Institute of Makareli University in Kampala, Uganda. This a faculty taught an HIV AIDS course for students from all over Africa. The idea was to transfer HIV AIDS skill to African healthcare workers, and they in turn would become mentors to other healthcare workers when they return to their own countries. Here I am with my students at the end of the course, celebrating the end of the course. We went to the Nile River to see its source. At the end of my assignment, I joined three Italian men to climb the third highest peak of Africa, Mount Margareta, of the Ruanzori mountain range. It was special for the Italians because that year was the 100th anniversary for the summit of Mount Margareta by an Italian prince. It was a gruesome nine-day hike. We ran into a blizzard on the day of our summit and here we are, finally, at the peak. 2008, I went out on my own on the tip of a church friend and went to Kenya, uh, towards Kisumu, which is on the western part of Kenya. Several months before that, Kenya had a troubled election in which either parties claimed victory, and there were unrest and tribal killing. That was also the year Obama was running for the presidency. 
and in Kenya, Obama posters were everywhere. As always, the uh, Mount Kenya loom, and so I told myself I had to climb the non-technical part of Mount Kenya, which is Mount Lenana. And then after that, went to the same Maasai Mara to do a safari. Uh, here is a lion with his kill. See lots of zebras and elephants. I also traveled to the famous Lake Nakuru to view the thousands upon thousands of flamingos and pelicans. It is quite an impressive sight. At the end, I ended up to Maseno Hospital in Kisumu. And Maseno Hospital is a mission hospital built in the late 19th century. And when I was there, I met Dr. Hardison. He had been there for seven years. And he was a retired GI doctor from California. He rounded seven days a week, two times a day, and also ran a mobile clinic every Saturday in one of the villages. He was a very busy man. Some nights when I was ready to brush my teeth, this would be the water coming out of the faucet. Marseille Hospital had women, men, and pediatric ward, as well as the maternity ward. Here's a slide of me with a baby who looks quite healthy despite a diarrhea illness. Tungiasis is a disease caused by the bites of sand fleas or jiggers. And actually, in all my African travels, this is the place where I would see jiggers. For some reason, I had never seen bad cases like that in other parts of Africa. Children, they often sleep on bare ground, dead ground, and often are bitten by the fleas. And eventually, these uh, bites become uh, chronic. Um, they form deformities. In one of our mobile clinic, uh, we saw three very malnourished children with jiggers, and they are shown here soaking their feet in disinfectant. Dr. Hardison's wife ran an often feeding program, and every weekend the children in a village were fed a combination of corn and beans. 2009, I headed to uh, Messina, which is here. The old name is Messina, at the border of South Africa and Zimbabwe. Bay Bridge is the town at the border of Zimbabwe and, uh, and South Africa. I arrived at a time um, which is in in Zimbabwe, it was a, quite a tumultuous time because of the land grabbing of the then President Mugabe, causing a hyperinflation with a rate as high as 400%. And also at the tail end of a cholera outbreak, which led to thousands of Zimbabwean refugees escaping to South Africa. Here's a picture of a woman with a baby on her back crawling below barbed wire to get to South Africa. When they cross the barbed wire, they then have to cross the Limpopo River, which is infested with crocodiles. And many of them drown, especially in the rainy season when the water level was high. And attacked by crocodiles or bandits after they reach shore, and women are often to, were often raped. Their destination was the makeshift shelter uh, and in the camp near Messina Hospital, where I mentor it in HIV AIDS. Makeshift because the materials they used were just cloth or plastic that they could find around the campground. A, a group of refugees cooking a, a cornmeal called Millipap. Here is a Fountain of Hope clinic where I mentored. Sometimes I rounded in the hospital with the doctors and nurses and work in the TV um, clinic and visited the healthcare, surrounding healthcare centers which refer patients to the Fountain of Hope Clinic. 
I had a rousing uh, send off celebration for me at the end of my volunteering period. That same year, I was asked to go to Nigeria to mentor in several HIV AIDS clinics in Abuja, which is the capital of Nigeria. There were three teams of us, three doctors and three nurses. Uh, we were from United Kingdom, United States, and Zambia. Before we left for Nigeria, we were sent reams of materials regarding the danger of possible kidnapping, terrorist attacks, and to avoid going to certain parts of Nigeria. This is one of the HIV AIDS clinics I mentored in of the University of Abuja. I always crowded almost 90% of the patients are women and children. One of the Nigerian doctors during our volunteering organized a trip for three of us to go to Kano. Kano is north of Abuja in northern Nigeria. He wanted us to see um, the palace ground of the Emir of Kano because it was, to, it was the end of Ramadan and he had a huge celebration uh, with a horseback parade. Kano is in the northern part of Nigeria where Boko Haram, the terrorist group, reigned. When we were in the airport, there were rumors of possible unrest in northern Nigeria. So my two colleagues decided to bail out. But in the end, I just went alone. Unbeknownst to us, the day before we were to leave for Kano, there was a prison breakout orchestrated by the terrorist group Boko Haram. So there were rumors of possible retaliation by the government. But I saw the Emir and his impressive horse parade at his palace grounds. This is a picture of a resplendently dressed horseback rider in Kano. My two friends who were left in Abuja spent their time, their four day off, at the Totem poolside. A far cry from what I went through. A few days after we left Abuja, there was a bombing and several people were killed. We were lucky nothing happened to us when we were volunteering there. When I was in Nigeria, my youngest child first started his Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone, uh, in a remote village there. So I decided to visit him. Here he is bargaining with a driver to get a ride to his village. My son and I arrived at the village center. And here he is, seen here in a classroom, teaching English and English literature. Since I was already in West Africa, I decided to do a six-country tour, starting with Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Togo, and Benin. During my tour, the most memorable place for me was Timbuktu in Mali where time seemed to have stood still. The famous mud mosque is in the town square. The mosque receives a coat of mud once a year, and the whole village participates. Because I'm a woman, I was not allowed inside the mosque. The caravan of uh, camels, at the, at the end of the day, Cross, uh, attempting to cross the Sahara, beginning to cross the Sahara Desert. And that's the sunset over the Sahara Desert. 2010, an earthquake hit Haiti, destroying many parts of Haiti, including the capital, Port-au-Prince. The aftermath of the earthquake uh, was evident all over the city. People who lost their homes set up tents in the square of Port-au-Prince, right across from the palace. 
I was able to go to help with project and development uh, right in Massachusetts. And they took us there to Haiti, and we set up several mobile clinics. Some months later, a cholera outbreak occurred in Haiti. A group of us was sent by Medical Teams International to St. Louis du Nord, running a cholera center. Most of you probably have read about the special cholera bed with a hole placed directly below the buttocks of the patient. They were usually so weak that they were unable to physically walk to the toilet. Here in the cholera center in Haiti, the toilet was just a huge pit in the backyard, challenging a patient to squat down in weak or weakened condition. Hydration is the main treatment, and it is amazing how a few liters of fluid would pick up a patient. As a pregnant woman was carried on a makeshift stretcher and traveling for four hours to our center. She was moribund when she arrived, but received revived up to two liters of IV fluid. Twenty eleven I went back to Uganda and this time further west of Kampala to a town called Mubarara to the Naki Valley refugee camp. This camp has been there for over 25 years in Uganda and has become a semi-permanent settlement. Together with USHCR and the International Organization for Migration, Medical Teams International has set up a very well-run clinic for the settlement. And the clinic has a medical clinic, a maternity ward, a pediatrician, as well as an immunization clinic. There's a group of patients waiting for the pharmacy to dispense their medicine. The same year, the Arab Spring went through northern Africa, Bahrain, and Yemen. I received a request to go to Libya to provide medical care for the internally displaced people from the war. It shows the city of Musurata, which was heavily attacked by Muammar Gaddafi in the spring of 2011, but the Musurati prevailed. The internally displaced people camps were mostly housed in abandoned apartment buildings, and that was where, also where we ran our clinic. There's a young girl with a bullet in her thigh, and she came in for a dressing change. We also worked in a few hospitals about 50 kilometers from the front line where Gaddafi forces were fighting the rebels in church, his birthplace. This woman was paralyzed in the waist down after she had been hit by a shrapnel. She was also postpartum. Some days we got to hitch a ride on, in the Chinook and the pilot had to fly far out into the Mediterranean Sea to avoid being hit by missiles. And though war was not enough, that year, the summer of 2011, was when one of the worst droughts hit the region of uh, southern Ethiopia, Somalia, and northern Kenya. A team of three of us joined a local non-governmental organization and we strive to run clinic traveling four hours a day. This is an aerial view of one of the largest refugee camps of Kenya called Dadaab. Because we were so close to Somalia, we had to be escorted by the Kenyan military. The security situation changed day by day and skirmishes between the military, the Kenyan military, and the Al Shabaab, the terrorist group of Somalia, landmines along the road were some of the obstacles. Halfway through uh, volunteering, a German non governmental organization called Medica sent a helicopter to fly us to the remote villages so we didn't have to travel for hours on that road. 
situate the 10 clinics uh, under an acacia tree in the village of Hami. The tree provided pressure shade for us in the hot weather. The patients, mainly Somalians, often crowding the entrance of the tent to be seen and to receive medicine. The women volunteer in our group were required to wear long sleeves, long skirts, and headscarves, which made us unbearably hot. Summer of 2012, conflict broke up between the rebels of the Democratic Republic of Congo and, uh, and the government forces. Thousands of refugees stream across to Uganda and Rwanda, and Kisoro became the center where UNHCR set up a transit camp. So this is called Nia Kabambi Transit Camp, set up by UNHCR in Kisoro district. They also set up many tents at the foothills, which could get quite cold at night. Even at this high elevation, we saw many, many cases of malaria. This is a 12-year-old boy who lost all his family in the mad rush to flee across to the border. When he left the, uh, the camp, he was still searching for his family. He ran a clinic next to the camp. This shows a woman with five children. They walked for a month with only the clothes in the back to go to the, to the refugee camp. They arrived one evening hungry, and half of them turned out to have malaria. The spring of 2013, a midwife and I flew to Juba, South Sudan. South Sudan just came, became the newest country in 2011 after 25 years of civil war. And so it was one of the poorest, poorest countries with the worst um, healthcare infrastructure. As a typical village in South Sudan, the hut also called Tuku. Inside the Tuku, where humans live alongside their livestock. We went there to provide care in the remote villages of the uh, northern part of South Sudan. There's a woman lying in a small ward uh, with cardboard as a mattress. The clinic was so in such a bad state that we often ran our mobile clinic under a tree. At the beginning of my stay, one of the chiefs in the village gave a ram for me as a gift and told me that I should bring it home on the plane. Shortly after I returned from South Sudan, I became ill and the diagnosis of dengue did not come until weeks later, a couple months later. By then, I was uh, already back in Africa. After I recovered, I went with Medicine from Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders, to volunteer for seven months in Malawi in an HIV AIDS mentoring, mentorship program. I was assigned to a village called Sanjay at the southern tip of Malawi, the lowest and hottest part of Malawi. Muslim South Frontiers collaborated with the Ministry of Health of Malawi, and I was overseeing 14 healthcare centers in this region. There's a picture of Sunday District Hospital, and my team of mentors, social worker, TV coordinator, and a logistician. Shortly after I returned, I answered to a call to provide medical care in the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan uh, hit the region. Devastated the eastern coast 
of the island. We ended up in Tacoban, which is right here on this big island of the Philippines. Part of the devastation caused by the typhoon. And here we are draining access in a youngster in the field. That can be a mysterious illness affected West Africa, which later turned out to be Ebola. Ebola was no stranger to East Africa, but West Africa had never seen a case of Ebola until 2014. This turned out to be the world's largest Ebola outbreak. Fruit bats are believed to be the host of Ebola. Deforestation has caused the bats to be living close to humans. These bats can infect other animals, and when the human hunts to eat them, they can be infected. The transmission can then occur from human to human through contact with body fluid and infected body. In the fall of 2014, at the peak of the Ebola outbreak, I went to Bong County in Liberia and volunteered in the newly built Ebola treatment unit. There's a sign here for the Ebola treatment unit on the roadside pointing to the unit deep in the jungle. The makeshift entrance to the Ebola treatment unit and the graphic representation of the unit where the ambulance will bring patients here in the trash area and they have the suspected ward as well as the confirmed ward, the mortuary which is here, and the path that leads even to the jungle to the cemetery. Cleaners were the first crew to enter the Ebola treatment unit in the morning to spray the Ebola unit with chlorine as well as to pick up garbage. Dawning, which usually took between 15 to 20 minutes to do in the stifling, hot and humid weather, um, could be quite daunting. And here the clock say 2.30 in the afternoon, the hottest part of the day. Doffing, believed to be the most dangerous part of the care of Ebola patients. The ambulance crew, the ambulance was actually just a truck. Um, oftentimes the crew had to crawl in to help the weak patients out of the ambulance. The burial team, all the people in contact with Ebola patients had to don full PPE. Christine here is the youngest patient that survived Ebola um, in the unit. She lost her mother her brother and her cousin. Two young survivors of the Ebola treatment unit celebrating after they received news that the Ebola tigers had turned negative. After my return from Liberia and after my quarantine, I left for Sierra Leone from another, for another stint of Ebola volunteering. Ebola cases in Liberia were decreasing while they were still high in uh, Sierra Leone. And Lunsa is the little town that I ended up in. That's an area view of the Ebola treatment center in Lunsa. At the entrance of the treatment unit. And the town of Lunsa got a sign to bring Ebola down to zero. Since then, I wrote a book called Let Me Forget, uh, a doctor's experience of life and death during the Ebola outbreak. And this is just to uh, recount the experiences that I had during the Ebola outbreak. My second book just came out a month ago into Africa, out of academia, a doctor's memoir, recounts my ex many experiences in Africa. Not long after I complete my, completed my 21 day of quarantine from Ebola, earthquake struck Nepal, right outside the capital of uh, Nepal for Kathmandu. The destruction caused by the earthquake. We tried to run mobile clinic, but it ended up more like doing an assessment of the damages 
to the clinic and how we could help them to fix the damages. In the summer of 2017, there were waves of killing of the Rohingya and burning of their villages in Myanmar, causing a massive exodus of 750,000 Rohingya refugees to Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, what UN called this a genocide. This is by far the largest refugee camp in the world. When one stands on top of hill, one can see the end of the camp. Moria Camp in Lesbos Island of Greece, a camp built to house 2,000 refugees five to six years ago, was now made to house 13,000. I was there two years ago, the number of refugees then was 7,000. This is believed to be the largest refugee camp in Europe, and the conditions were appalling. Many lived in tents uh, set up in the olive grove, Initially built to house uh, Syrian refugees, but the population have shifted now to Afghanistan, Iranian, and the refugees from Sub-Saharan Africa. This past September, with COVID lockdown, the frustration of the refugees came to a head and they set the camp on fire. 13,000 people were immediately made homeless. Slides show refugees sleeping on the road uh, right after the fire. Children sleeping on the thin blanket on the highway. Last November, a group of us um, were sent by Met Global and Project Hope to Yemen, which has been in the grip of civil war for the last five years. Besides cholera outbreak, Yemen has one of the highest malnutrition rates in the world, and one million women and two million children now nourish. We were in, in Sayun and Marib. Marib is about 75 miles away from Sana, the capital, which is under the control of rebels. Our travel from Sayun to Marib um, is a five-hour journey. Um, at one of the checkpoints, there are many checkpoints between the two cities. This is the displaced people camp in Marip and the clinic in uh, Sayun. So what are the challenges of volunteering? It is always hard and heartbreaking to witness so much poverty, violence, pain, hunger, despair, suffering, preventable death, especially when the children are the victims. It's to witness the poor infrastructures, the severe lack of resources, medicine, laboratory tests, and personnel. Women and girls are at risk for rape and often are left to care for their children and grandchildren. Trauma of refugees of war and conflict, with many suffering from PTSD and not many qualified mental health workers around. Corruption of the government who misappropriate funds, uh, no donor funding, to their own pocket, to be away from home, and to experience a transition to see the stark contrast between healthcare in developed and developed countries. In our world today, uh, I'm going to throw a few statistics. 80% of humanity lives on less than $10 a day. Of the two billion children worldwide, a billion of them live in poverty. One in three children are without adequate shelter, one in five without access to safe water, one in seven without access to health services, and about a third of the children living in developing countries are underweight. More than a third of the growing urban population in developing countries live in slums. A quarter of humanity lives without electricity. Some bil one billion people in developed countries have inadequate access to water. Two and a half billion lack basic sanitation, and close to half of those in this country suffer from health problems caused by water and sanitation deficits. Over half a million prospective mothers in developing countries die annually in childbirth of complications from the pregnancy. 
72 million children are out of school around the world, a figure equivalent to the entire primary school age in Europe and North America. The 1% of the, of the money that was spent in weapons in the world was spent in education. Every child would be able to attend school. At the end of 2019, 76, 80 million people are displaced, about 1% of the world population. Almost half of them were children. 26 million refugees, 46 million internally displaced people, 4.2 asylum seekers, and 2.6 million Venezuelans displaced abroad. Despite of a very malnourished baby who later died a few days after admission, a cleft palate prevented this baby to suckle properly. If the child left alone at the busy entrance of the gas station, he back right in the middle of the uh, city of Kampala. A slum in Kampala. Girls are often taken out of school to do household chores and to get married. Here two girls are collecting water from a sewage pipe. With school closure because of the pandemic, more than 24 million children are out of school. Here in India, a teacher gently conducts classes in a space between closed classroom buildings. The pandemic, children out of school are often made to earn a living for the, for the family. There's a boy collecting recycled bottles. The pandemic has put a stop to my volunteering in far-flung places, but I did volunteer at Amherst Hospital during the epicenter, uh, the epicenter of the COVID uh, outbreak in New York City in April. Here I am in my full PPE. And United Nations Declaration of Human Rights defines human rights as a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of a man and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. What could one person do? Pandemic has given us time to reflect. We could donate our time, skills, and money. One need not have to donate time and skill. One can donate money and resources to help the people in need. If you fail to do any of that, will become irrelevant. One can be the voice of the voiceless people, such as the Rohingya, and many of the refugees stuck in limbo. Stateless, waiting for a country to accept them, their lives are on hold. One can lift the li a life that would lift the lives of others. Chris Bourgeon said, a single ordinary person can still make a difference, and single ordinary people are doing that precisely every day. Dr. Intangre Wadrogo is a surgeon who volunteered for a year on mercy ship, operating on congenital deformities such as cleft lips, cleft palate, removing lumps and bumps. These people were often shunned by society, because of the deformities. And he said that maybe for the world, we are one person. But for those people who are helping, we are the world. We cannot change the entire world, but we can change the world for somebody. In the same vein, the story of the starfish adapted from Lauren Isley tells of a story of an elderly man walking on the beach one morning and seeing a child throwing starfish into the ocean. He asked, why are you throwing starfish into the sea? The child smiled brightly, pointed upward, and with perfect simplicity replied, The sun is up, the tide is going out. If I don't throw them in, they will die. But don't you realize, as the man, there are miles and miles of beach and starfish all along it. You can't possibly make a difference. The child listened politely, then bent down, picked up another starfish, threw it gently into the sea, just beyond the breaking waves and joyfully declared, it makes a difference for this one. My favorite quotation from Nelson Mandela, what counts in life is not the fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the life we lead. I remember my secondary school teacher 
who took us to the free library, wealthy college who gave me, which gave me a scholarship, Chicago Medical School, which accepted me, the woman from the financial aid office who gave me advice. These all contributed to lift my life. They might not be aware of the impact they had when they perform one good deed and perform it well. All these actions did make a difference in my life. They caused a ripple which spread and affects the lives of many others. So in conclusion, voluntary can be hard, but it can also be fun. Here I am, having fun riding a donkey right into the sunset of Lamo Island in Kenya. I'd like to uh, make a little pitch about my upcoming event in January, a discussion on my book with Dr. Nareen Ahmed in January 19, which is far away. At 7 p.m., you can register at this link if you're interested. And so we're close to the hour, so have some time for question and answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lai. That was a, a, a riveting uh, presentation. Um, you have an absolutely um, impressive uh, background um, and a, an impressive long list of accomplishments. And um, to that list of accomplishments, which really impresses me, I'll add that I'll point out to everyone that she got through 160 slides in about 45 minutes. All right, I've, ne I've never seen anything like that before. Um, so that is also incredibly impressive. We will open up the floor now um, for any questions. Um, if you could um, raise raise your hand and um, acknowledge acknowledge yourself or um, uh, submit uh, via chat. I'm looking at the list of participants. If anyone has their their hand raised, um, as people are formulating. Uh, their their questions and again you can you may put place them into the into the chat I'll start off with uh, one question um, so Dr. Lai um, amongst um, um, the participants today are a number of students um, um, CMS students who were scheduled um, to to go to um, Uganda um, as, as well as some of our other global health sites um, over this past summer unfortunately um, they were unable to go due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, but what, what advice um, or what guidance would you have for them as second year medical students or third year medical students who will one day um, want to follow in your footsteps? Are, are they going for a, a course or are they, what, what is the program that they are going for in Uganda? Well, so within, within Uganda, this is um, one of our uh, global health elective um, offerings and are, are able to uh, shadow clinicians um, both um, within a hospital in, in Kampala as well as a, um, um, a clinic uh, just outside of Kampala and an NGO. Mm. Well, I think that I, I, I kind of envy those students who are in global health early on in their career because that's not one of the offerings we had when we started school. Um, so I think you should take full advantage of your experience. I don't know whether you can... Um, begin to formulate a career path for yourself, but I think to absorb all the experiences you could uh, in the country, the healthcare infrastructure, uh, the healthcare personnel you meet with, the patients, the country, just absorb the culture, um, immerse yourself in it. And I think that as a student, you probably should enjoy all those things, um, whether you eventually gel to form, formulate a career in global health. It will be something that you will have to do later in your life. But as a second year student, I think immersion, immerse yourself in all aspects of uh, Uganda and its healthcare will be what I would do. I just would enjoy myself and get to know the people and get to know the patients. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have a, a question from Ruth, and then after Ruth, um, Joshua. Hi. Um, I just was wondering, how did you manage also like your um, personal life, like your kids, um, all of these, while also like 
traveling and, and the financial aspect of, of having a life devoted to global health issues and, and serving the world. How did you manage uh, personal life and finances? Well, it, it's some question that you need to face and I, did, I kind of delayed my um, aspiration to volunteer until my children were grown because I couldn't see myself doing that while there was two children and babies. And so I needed to be there when they were still young. So I actually waited till my youngest was almost in college, but although he was still in high school, he wasn't too pleased about that. Um, yeah, so I think you have to make that kind of choices to see whether you want to do it early on or you want to delay going to global health until your children or your family is older. Um, some finances, uh, because I began it older, I was have been able to earn my money and save my money. So that is another issue that is more or less soft for me because some of the volunteer organizations I go with, you practically have to foot your own, um, your own fare, your own stay and your own meal. So the whole expense is on your shoulder. But some of the bigger NGOs that I go with, they help you with uh, flights and lodging meals and sometimes even a per diem to buy your meals. So it depends on the organization. Smaller organizations really depend on the volunteers to foot their finances. So it can be quite a problem if you want to do long term. Thank you. Joshua? Hi, my name is Josh Williams. I'm a psychiatrist here. Um, and I, I was interested to know what your experiences were, you know, with, from a global mental health perspective. Did, did you work with psychiatrists or people on the ground who came in to volunteer? Um, did, you know, did you have any interactions with psychiatrists on the ground? I know you're an infectious disease doctor, but you did mention sort of the, the impact of trauma, migration, all that stuff on mental health. So I'm just kind of curious what your interactions were with uh, people like me. That is a very good question, because right at the outset of a disaster response, it was the acute trauma that we took care of, physical trauma. Uh, so we had to you know, bruise and bumps and lumps, whatever we have to take care of. But then as the disaster has quieted down, you realize that the mental health issue peak. Um, there are many instances when we felt that our hands were tied, we didn't have the proper uh, mental health uh, advisor on ground to help us with some of the issues that we, we face. Because a lot of patients would come to our clinic with a complaint, but when you ask more deeper questions, you realize that it's not a physical complaint, it's a mental health issue, uh, it's, it's post-traumatic syndrome. And so those are the issues that we actually uh, raised and some of the um, um, smaller NGOs that we have worked with uh, have eventually um, gone into hiring mental health workers to come and help the people with their mental health issues. And I find that is actually much better if you could find local people who could speak the local language, who understand the culture, to help the people uh, with the mental health issues. Coming from the Western world and trying to solve the uh, mental health issues of these people, you have the layer of translation that you have to go through. So it's quite difficult for uh, somebody from outside to help the people with the mental health issues. And I, I agree with you that it's something that after the period, the acute period of disaster, you begin to see all this post-traumatic syndrome um, appearing. And that's the time when mental health um, work, workers should come in. Even early on, we have seen some as well. So I think mental health uh, issues should be addressed as part of the disaster response. Um, so that is something that is quite important. Um, especially in a camp like uh, Emoria, Emoria camp, which had been in existence for six years now, 
uh, people stayed there for three or four years. Um, they couldn't get out because they were waiting for a country to shut them. And they were the ones who had really bad mental health issues. And the resources were so bad. And sometimes I, I wonder how they survive in a cramped quarters, hoping for someone to come and help them with their mental health problem. This is beyond my uh, imagination. Yeah, they could use, uh, I mean, if you are a mental health worker, certainly if you go to a refugee camp, you could counsel yourself to some people and train some people to do mental health counseling. So that, that would be a very good way of counseling yourself to local people who can then use the skill uh, and use their, the closeness of their culture and their language to help the, uh, the people in, uh, in trouble. Thank you. Okay, question uh, from Emily. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much, first of all, for speaking to us. Um, really quickly before I ask my question, actually, shameless plug, but um, we are actually having someone come speak about humanitarian psychiatry and psychology and whatnot next month. So if you're interested in that, that'll be put on by the Global Health Interest Group. Keep an eye out for that. Um, but I was just wondering if, you felt like being a woman has kind of hampered or changed your ability to practice in the locations that you've been in, just because I feel like a lot of the places you've gone are places where women are not generally given the opportunity to be educated and to work in fields like medicine and whatnot. Um, I feel like a lot of the countries in Africa, women are still somewhat viewed as property and, you know, married off young to mother, children, and things like that. So I was just wondering how that impacted your experience and your ability to do what it is that you wanted to do and take care of patients. I, maybe my very first time in Africa, I felt that my mentee, the person that I was mentoring, uh, felt a little bit awkward because I was the woman trying to help him to learn. So that was a barrier there. So it took me some time to win him over to me so because he was a man and I was a woman trying to teach him so that that was the barrier I felt and I think it was true in other instances when I was not really teaching them I think people were very receptive uh, if I'm giving a didactic course um, everybody will listen I don't I didn't feel like there was any uh, problem for me to uh, to teach I think uh, even the patients, patients are uh, very receptive to people coming to help them, to take care of them. So the, the men equally are receptive to me in the, in the Rohingya uh, refugee camp, which is enormously big and the many, many patients waiting to see you. They have no problem you know, seeing me. Um, they would just tell me the problem. So I didn't really feel like a barrier in uh, reaching across to the patients. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, I will do a, a time check here. Um, we have reached the, uh, we've actually surpassed um, our, our scheduled time, but Dr. Lai, uh, depending upon your availability, I see that there are um, a few other people that have questions. And um, do you have a few minutes to, um, to answer? Okay. Um, Varsha and then uh, Dima. Hi, uh, Dr. Lai. Thank you so much um, just for sharing your experiences. Honestly, it, it you have such an incredible story, and it's really inspiring for us as students to just be able to hear all that you have done. Um, I was wondering, you know, especially because um, you have seemed to have gone to so many different places and done so many things, um, did you find that there were any certain limitations or uh, barriers? I know you um, briefly discussed um, even just the language barrier, and um, Emily mentioned um, just the fact that you are a woman practicing. Um, are there any other significant um, limitations or barriers that you felt um, to practice medicine um, in all these various countries? I really have not. I think that I am in the unusual position of being um, a minor minority, so I have some occasions where 
I, I don't like to state it, but I am kind of an Asian woman among a lot of Westerners and uh, in voluntary situations. So I'm kind of an unusual person <laughs> in a group. And sometimes I, they ignore me. Uh, so I was not like one of them because they, they, they would powwow among themselves and do things among themselves. And I was just, you know, a different Asian person. So the, I, I had felt that, but, you know, besides that, patients are fine with me. And uh, I think in the world of volunteering, there have been issues uh, raised recently about um, e- unequal treatment of nationals and expats. And so there are issues that are being addressed by big organizations such as Doctors Without Borders. Payment issues, uh, unequal payment uh, among volunteers, not volunteers, but workers. Workers and national workers are paid less than if they are Western workers. Um, Things like that. And uh, they are trying to address that. And I think that if you look at the world of Doctors Without Borders, the headquarters are all in the Western world. Uh, even though they they do go to Africa, they do go to South America, uh, there are no headquarters in Africa. So they're trying to kind of equalize that uh, power structure and that making more uh, people, the local people rising to the leadership level. You, I sense it a lot that when you, um, I volunteer the longest with Doctors Without Border and there is a hierarchy of people at the top and people at the bottom. People at the top are usually white, people at the bottom are more um, national people. And you feel that you want to address your issues very um, discreetly because if you are national, if you complain, you may lose your job. So there's this unequal power in the power structure which needs to be addressed. But as a woman, um, Some, you, you do have quirky people who think you're just a woman, you can't do things. But I, I usually try to ignore that. I think that I find the local people very accepting of women as a healthcare person. Thank you. And please, Dima, when you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Lay, very impressive presentation. So my question is based on what you mentioned about the need for mental health interventions, especially for trauma victims. And recently, because of COVID, we've been seeing more and more use of virtual technology. Do you think that's something that people who are located outside these areas can help with as mental health providers do not always need to perform a physical exam or do procedures. So do you think, and I know that the lack of maybe devices or the lack of even internet may be a big barrier and the language may be a barrier, but how do you see the use of technology may help in sometimes teaching people to do mental health interventions in these areas? I think it's a good idea. I think it's something that it should be pursued. Um, you know, you could reach out to uh, some NGOs that are uh, using mental health workers. I think if you have people on site speaking mm-hmm. the language, you know, um, I mean, they have to social distance with the COVID outbreak, uh, but still comforting to have somebody present. But short of that, if you don't have that kind of uh, facility, I think what you suggest is a very, very viable solution. And I think it's something that, especially if you are trying to teach them how to counsel and how do you use the method to help the people with PTSD, that that, that is a very, very viable option. Better than you don't have anything at all or waiting and waiting for the government to make uh, accessible some of the mental health workers that they have, which is they are very limited. Yeah, especially mm-hmm. when I was in Lesbos, it would be two, three months before a patient who had been diagnosed with some kind of traumatic problem 
could not see a, a mental health person for two, three months, which is really yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. So I think that if you have a virtual um, visit, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful idea. I thank think you. how COVID has taught us to uh, yes. be innovative. <laughs> innovative. That's true. That's true. Thank you for answering. We, we appreciate your, your presentation today and we appreciate you being so very generous uh, with your time um, as, as well. Um, this is, um, oh, I wanted to make the point, the point as well, and this is with a complete bias as a uh, return Peace Corps volunteer that um, I thank you too for, for producing a, uh, a Peace Corps volunteer, your son, um, um, service. I, I, I did not really happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, I was in, uh, in, in the Gambia and I spent time in Sierra Leone. So I'm, um, uh, glad that he had that experience and that you were able to visit him, um, during, during his services as, as well. That is, that is very, uh, uh wonderful to hear. Um, you have, um, uh, not only, uh, um, uh, I think for many of the, the people on this call, uh, particularly the students, um, expanded, their horizons and given a, a very clear vision on what their role um, as um, uh, healthcare providers within a global health context uh, may uh, may look like, and um, it's been very very inspirational and and and, and educational. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I look forward um, to to reading your your newest book um as 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 well and um uh, i will look forward to attending uh that event we'll get that um that link out to the um uh, participants um as well do you have any um other uh, uh final parting words before we end today's session no I, I, would, I would thank you very much for inviting me and uh i want to wish all the students in global health good luck all right thank you so much and thank you all for joining us today Bye-bye.